Hi, my name is Lauren. So this is a follow-up video to a video that I released a few weeks ago about an end times dream. When I initially recorded the first video, I didn't have the full interpretation of the dream, but I've had a few weeks to pray and do research and think about the dream and ask the Holy Spirit about a revelation about the dream. And I feel like I have a more clear interpretation of the dream now and then I have also just felt like really led to release another video. I do believe this dream is an end times prophetic dream about Israel and about end times revival. So I really find it like a really exciting dream and I hope it blesses you and gives you the ability to participate with me in intercession and prayer about these things. I also feel led that this video is meant to be a prophetic declaration of what God plans to do in this time. And, you know, I think he allows us to participate in bringing his will to earth. And one of the ways he does that is by speaking through prophecy and through dreams. So let this be what he wants it to be. This is to glorify Christ to glorify God plans for the earth has nothing to do with me. I'm not special. I'm just like a random person and I feel very blessed that he gave me this dream. So yeah, take it for what it's worth. Bring everything to scripture, test everything in the spirit. But I really truly believe that's what this dream is about. So I'm going to recap the dream and then I'm also going to go through it and kind of like break it down symbolically and also, also visit some scriptures that he's given me about the dream. You might have seen my first video, but I think I have a better understanding and ability to talk about this now that a little time has passed. So so I initially had the dream on January 19th, 2024. So it's almost a month ago. So this the dream happens in three parts. And the first part of the dream was slightly unclear, but I did receive in the dream, I received a prophetic message from God. And even during the dream, I knew it was a prophetic message. So basically, it was there was an, a message or understanding that two or more groups would be brought together. This is my dream journal that I'm reading from. So there was a prophetic message that two or more groups would be brought together in the context of Christ and his church. And in the dream, these two or more groups like were friends or families of mine and my brother's. I have one older brother, my only sibling, and so that was that was the first part of the dream. It was like nothing really happens other than the fact that I received this message or understanding, like knowledge that two or more groups of people would be brought together in the context of Christ and his church. And then, so the second part of the dream, my husband and I went to a store, and we while we're at the store we bought a little cactus in a pot. So it's just a small potted plant, but it was a paddle of a prickly pear that it was like halfway submerged in the ground. So basically like a shoot of a prickly pear that, in, that was like in a pot. And then, so we bring it back to our apartment. We live in New York City. We bring it back to our apartment and it seems to grow like overnight or in like one day and it's growing super fast. It's even growing so fast that I'm basically like watching it grow with my bare eyes. And it's seemingly like overnight grows to be like about like three, three or yeah, about three feet tall. And the strange thing about this prickly pear is that it has multiple arms and like kind of branches. Some of the prickly pear paddles are like round like, I'm not sure if you're familiar with prickly pear, but it can come in different varieties. And some of the paddles were like round, but then other paddles were like kind of long and narrow and oblong. And it's, I think it symbolizes, well, I think it's different varieties of prickly pear, but I'm going to come back to that. So basically I was like shocked at how fast it grew. And yeah, that was the second part of the dream. Then in the third part of the dream, I'm standing on a sidewalk outside a building and there are multiple different meetings going on inside this building to my right. Like I can see doorways and windows and like through, I can, I sense that there are people wandering around and coming into this building. There are people coming to go to this building. And 
There's a girl standing on the sidewalk in front of me, and she's speaking to me. And she's kind of chastising me a little bit, saying, you received an important prophetic message and are completely unfazed. She says, you're treating this very nonchalantly, like it happens every day. And she says this, and I remember the message that I receive in the first part of the dream, the fact that multiple groups of people would be brought together in the context of the church. And I look to my right at the building and I see there are meetings going on inside. And on the second floor, there's a meeting going on and I can see through an open window on the second floor that there, there's standing next to the window is a Jewish man wearing a white and blue prayer cloth or prayer shawl. I initially thought it was a Hasidic man and it very well could represent Hasidic people. I think it's a bit more open-ended than that. I think it represents Jewish people as a whole, but I'll come back to that. I Because the reason I think it could be more open-ended to Jewish people as a whole is that many different types of Jewish people wear these prayer shawls. I mostly associate them with Hasidic men because I live in New York and I see them around. I see them wearing these prayer shawls. But so anyway... So I see on the second floor, there's this Jewish man wearing a prayer shawl in the second floor window, and it seems like there's some sort of meeting going on. And then I look down, and above the doorway to this building, it says Iglesia. So it's the Spanish word for church, Iglesia, with an I. It's related to our word, Ecclesia, spelled with an E. So the building says Iglesia on the front. And... I, in the dream, I asked the girl, is this part of the, is this an example of the groups coming together? But I don't think I got an answer. There seemed to be multiple meetings going on in the same building. And it, I did seem to get a kind of confirmation that like, yes, it was. And that was more like confirmation in the spirit. That's where the dream ended. And then, yeah, so it's a cool dream. So I'm now I'm going to like break it down. It's a super cool dream, especially because I didn't understand a lot of this symbolism when I had the dream initially. So I really believe this dream is an important, timely message about Israel and about the salvation of Israel, which is like amazing. And then really the symbolism of the prickly pear is like the most incredible thing to me. And I'm going to come back to that. But basically the first part of the dream, there was a literal prophetic message and I have received literal prophetic messages and dreams before so I do it this resonates with me as like literally a like a word from the Lord uncoded basically uncoded so the prophetic word was that multiple communities of mine and my brothers friends and families would be coming together I think that my brother and I are symbolic in the dream as being not exactly brothers and sisters in Christ but two branches of a tree from the same root, if that makes sense. So it's like brother and sister, we have the same father. So you could also look at it as Jewish people and Christian people have the same father. We all acknowledge the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's like the God of the Old Testament. He is God the Father. So we have the same father as our Jewish brothers and sisters. So another thing, though, that I believe this means is that I was praying about this last night and the Lord spoke to me a little bit saying, my brother is also symbolic here because my brother is a bit of a prodigal, like prodigal. He was a Christian and has left, left the faith and I believe now considers himself an atheist. But, you know, I do pray for him. But I think in the dream, my brother is a symbol in the dream for the prodigals returning to the church. So I think that that is going to be like an end times movement of God, something that happens in the in relationship to revival and the end times harvest. So this is my interpretation of the dream. This is like what I believe the Lord is saying. So I believe this dream is all about end times harvest and like salvation, people attaining salvation and like coming to know Jesus. So in the second part of the dream, my husband and I go to a store and buy a plant. And for context, my husband and I live in New York City 
and we do not own plants so this is like an unusual thing for us to do this is like not something we ever do we don't own plants in the dream we're in this we're in a city it's like a very it's like covered in you know it's like a strip mall or something uh it's like it's not a it's not a lush beautiful place. We're going to basically a strip mall like a parking lot covered in cement to buy a potted plant. So I do think this is symbolic for desolate land and the fact that I am in New York. I do believe there is an aspect of this dream that is about New York and that there is going to be something that happens in New York that that travels outward from this place. So, like, you know, different cities have sort of different spiritual resonance and weight and sort of spiritual trajectories, spiritual momentum, spiritual footprint or path that seems they seem to walk in. And, you know, New York is called the Empire State. So, and culturally, for America, a lot of things happen in New York first before they go out to the rest of the country and even the world. New York is like a really you know, culturally important place for the entire world. So it's very possible that that God is speaking specifically about something that is related to what could happen in New York and have repercussions, bigger repercussions for the world. In the dream, the prickly pear is in a potted plant. And again, it's like the prickly pear is a plant that thrives in really tough conditions. You know, I live in New York City. There's no greenery. I live in a very industrial part of New York City, an industrial part of Brooklyn. So there is no greenery here. There's no plants. For a plant to thrive in the city, I do think it is symbolic that in the dream, the prickly pear is in a potted plant. So I'll come back to that. When I initially had this dream, I did not know the relevance of the prickly pear to Israel. So this was something, if you go back and watch my first video, you'll hear how excited I am to like learn this. But basically, this, I mean, this is the coolest part of the dream to me. And when I realized this, I thought it was like so cool. When I was praying about the dream, as soon as I had it, I had this sort of question form in my mind like, well, I wonder, because I knew there was a Jewish person in the third part of the dream. So I was like, well, I wonder if cactuses grow in Israel. I mean... I'm not, I've never been to Israel, so, and I don't watch the news really, to be honest. I don't even have a TV. So I was, had this question form in my mind, like, I wonder if cactuses grow in Israel. So I Googled it and like, sure enough, like, guess what the like most like common cactus is to grow in Israel? It's the prickly pear. And so not only that, but the prickly pear is considered like a cultural symbol for a Jewish person born in Israel. So they use this term sabra for the fruit, the prickly pear fruit. Prickly pear is the type of cactus that actually like forms a fruit and this fruit is harvested. So prickly pear is like a major crop in Israel. Isn't that wild? So like I did not know that when I had this dream. I like had I had no clue about that. I think there is also a bit of a loaded, it's a bit of a loaded symbol for Israel because it's also used as like a fence. It like propagates and like grows and spreads super fast. And in some areas it can also be used as like a division between land. So I think people in Palestine also use it as a sort of division of land and like protective even protective measure because of the spines you know it's a cactus so in the dream it's like a potted plant with a cactus inside of it so I do believe this is a symbol for Jewish people in New York because if you think about it it's like a pot of a plant that's been transported and we can we can see that that is that the prickly pear is a symbol of Israel So it's like a potted plant in transported to New York, thriving in and thriving, growing super fast, thriving in really unlikely conditions, because not only is New York cold and wet, (laughs) but it's also covered in cement. So not only, 
you know, all of these, despite the fact that New York itself is not conducive to spiritual things, like New Yorkers tend to really, I would guess that probably most New Yorkers are atheists. I, it is not a, sp- a place that is conducive to spiritual things. So, but nevertheless, this plant thrives and grows. And in the third part of the dream, I see this Jewish man worshiping in a building that says Iglesia. And Iglesia is the Spanish word for church. So all over Brooklyn, all over New York, there are these Spanish churches because there's a really large Spanish-speaking population here. There are people here from Puerto Rico, Mexico, the Dominican Republic. You know, it's just a very large Spanish-speaking population. The church I actually go to is predominantly Puerto Rican, even though the entire service and worship is in English for the most part, although we will have like an occasional worship song in Spanish. The Spanish church is really thriving here. I will say that the the church that I go to is like the most sincere, like filled with the spirit, Bible-believing church like I've ever been to. And it, but it's small, you know, these are small churches. These are not big mega churches. These are like small groups of very sincere believers. So in the dream the the this Jewish man is it's seemingly like worshiping inside a Spanish speaking church. So I do believe that there is something about these two groups coming together. I do believe that this is about end times revival. So I'm going to tell you exactly why I believe that. There's three major scriptures that I'm going to point to for this dream that I used interpreting this dream. It was from Joel, Hosea, and then the book of Romans. When I first started praying about this dream, Holy Spirit first gave me these verses from Joel, and it's a pretty long text. It's Joel 2, 15 through 24. I think I will read most of it, but I might skip around a little bit. So, Joel 2, 15 through 24. Blow the trumpet at Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. So, I mean, the bride and the bridegroom are definitely a symbol of Christ and the church. So this is... I believe this is referencing like an end times prophecy and I'm not I'm not just sort of pulling that out of nowhere for some of the research in this I like did reference prophecy study Bible and I do believe that this is part of end times prophecy about the coming together in the last days the end times revival and the the final harvest of God's people So let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove you far from the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up. His foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I really do believe that this is about... The end times, the end times movement of the Holy Spirit and the end times revival. And it's talking about, well, not only does it t- say that it's like it's time for the bridegroom and the bride to come out of their chambers. So we can assume that that means either it doesn't really matter if you believe in the rapture, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. To me, that's not really 
the point of discussion here, but that is a signal that it, this is an end times prophecy. And then it's talking a lot about the threshing floors shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. So there is a lot of different speculation about like exactly what grain and new wine and oil represents. But I think you could interpret it several different ways. We know that grain, wine, and oil were all used in the Old Testament tabernacle. Like in the tabernacle, the ancient Israelites were using to worship God because they had the bread of the presence. There was a a wine or drink offering and then also the oil and the lampstands. I think you could also look at it maybe as a symbol of the Trinity. So like the word of God is the bread of life and then the wine is a symbol of the blood of Christ and then the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. I think you could look at all of these actually as the provision of God's spirit and his people. So I think there's a lot of ways to interpret these, but I think overall it's like a symbol of God pouring out his spirit in the last days. And then if you go on in this chapter, this is also the the chapter in Joel where he says like, where it says, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. That That is actually following this chap, this part that I just read. So I do believe this is like an out time, in times pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So there's that. But then this morning, the Lord also gave me this other verse in Hosea, and it's so similar. Uh, it's it's actually like amazing, and it really just reconfirmed to me that that is what this is about, and it is about the, the end times harvest. And so Hosea 1.10, Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. I mean, it's so beautiful, and it's actually talking about like the coming together of the people of Judah, which we know that Jesus was a descendant of the tribe of Judah. And the people of Israel, I mean, Israel is God's nation, even if they are spread out over the world. So it's like the coming together of the church and the Israelites. And then it says, for great will be the day of Jezreel. And the name Jezreel actually means God plants. So it's so cool. I love this so much. It makes me so excited. Okay, so... Not only that, but then if we go to the New Testament in the book of Romans, if you're not familiar, you probably are. This is like not, you know, you're probably familiar, pretty familiar with the book of Romans. But chapters 9, 10, and 11 are all about Israel and their context to the gospel of salvation of Jesus. So in this, in these three chapters, Paul is really outlining what it means, the fact that the Israelites, the Jewish people, did not accept Jesus as their Messiah, the fact that God allowed their hearts to be hardened, and the fact that God did not reject them. This does not mean that God rejected them, and it doesn't mean that they will not have salvation. He talks about how salvation will come about for the Jewish people and how they will be, how they will accept the Messiah, how they will accept Jesus as their Messiah. So the part that I really find the most important, and in the other thing that I think is really interesting in this is that in this chapter, Paul uses the symbolism of the olive tree and how even though a branch of the olive tree is cut off, a new one is grafted in. So like the old the old branch is cut off, so that would be the Israelites or the Jewish people cut off from the original plant, and then a new one is grafted in. Those are the believers in Christ. But that we all have the same root, we all have the same Father in heaven, and that if he says, like, if an old branch has been cut off, how much more easily would that old branch be able to be grafted back in again? So the really cool thing about olive trees is that olive trees like recognize each other. You can have multiple different types of olives 
growing from the same plant. And that is because it's very easy to graft in different types of olives, olive branches from different trees into one plant. So you could have an olive tree with different branches and different olives on each branch. So in chapter 11 of Romans, Paul is talking about this. And then he's saying, In verse 23, he says, And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? And then this is the most incredible part. He says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. This is like the most exciting part to me because, so I do believe that this means we are like approaching the fullness of the Gentiles, the fullness of the harvest of the Gentiles. So I believe, I think this is so exciting and like, I mean, I really believe this is like an end times revelation prophecy about end times harvest and revival. So I, before I had this dream, I had been feeling like God had been telling me to pray for end times harvest. And he'd been telling me to pray that the season was changing for the harvest. And yeah, I mean, that is like, I mean, that's why I started a YouTube channel, basically, is because I want to spread the gospel. I didn't really foresee the fact that I would be sharing, like, a in-time stream, but I'm a, I want to be obedient and do what God tells me to do. But, yeah, so, you know, I really do care about sharing the gospel with people and, like, letting people know Jesus, like, encouraging people to know Jesus and come to salvation. So, the other some other ideas or some other things that have sort of occurred to me is that I don't know exactly how this falls into the timeline of end times. Some people might believe that the Jewish people don't come to salvation in large numbers until after the rapture. Other people might believe that the rapture doesn't take place until the very end of the tribulation and I don't really know how I don't really know the answer to this. This is something I've been asking, but I think this is one of the things that God has kept veiled for his own purpose. So I do believe that we are approaching the fullness of the Gentiles because I think that's what this dream is about. In the dream also, there's a prickly pear. The prickly pear cactus, when it when it grows, it has multiple different branches. This is, okay, this is another thing I forgot to mention. The prickly pear is not native to Israel. The prickly pear is actually native to Mexico and to Spanish-speaking countries. Like, it's also really common in Puerto Rico and other, like, South American countries, so, and also the southwestern part of the United States. So, like, I do believe that it is a really important symbol of not just Israel, but also Spanish-speaking countries. And something about this connection of the Jewish people to the Spanish-speaking church in New York. I have no clue how that might come about, but that those are the two symbols I see coming together in both parts of the dream. But the second and third part of the dreams, because it's like the prickly pear is a symbol, can be a symbol really for Israel, because we know that they use the term sabra to refer to the prickly pear fruit, but then also to a Jewish person born in Israel, because the idea is that they're tough on the outside, but sweet on the inside, prickly on the outside, but soft on the inside. Um, so it's sort of like a cultural kind of like a cultural word for a Jewish person born in Israel. And the, but then also, I mean, the, the prickly pear is native to Mexico and to like Puerto Rico and like South America. So it's like two, it is two symbols, two peoples coming together. And in, in the third part of the dream, it's also the Jewish man worshiping inside the Spanish speaking church. So 
I don't fully understand what God is saying about this, but I say, like, let it be, and I just accept it and declare it and pray that God's will be done and that it come forth as he wants it to. And if it means the salvation of Jewish people, like, that's amazing. So in I, I also kind of wonder about the fact that I see the Jewish man on the second floor And there is this idea, this sort of prophetic word that I've heard from several other prophets lately saying there's a call for people to come up higher and come up higher in the spirit to to step higher into their spiritual calling and to become more attuned to the spirit, the Holy Spirit, and like what the Holy Spirit is doing in this time. And the fact that the Jewish man in my dream is on the second floor of the church rather than on the ground floor. He's on the second floor. So I think that could either mean that it will be a time like it'll occur during a time where there's a huge outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I feel like that's what it's resonating with me the most. And I believe that a huge outpouring of the Holy Spirit is kind of what would be called for or needed for there to be a large revival and kind of large in time harvest of people. There's another there's another aspect to this because in Romans in chapter 11 Paul also talks about provoking Israel to jealousy because the Christians like believers in Christ have the Holy Spirit and the the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in their lives is like tangible evidence and that that is something that actually like will provoke Israel to jealousy. And it says Yeah, it's in chapter 11. It says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? Meaning like, did they, are they irrevocable because they didn't accept Christ? No, he's not saying that. He says, may it never be. But their transgression, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So I think that's so cool. Like Paul is also the one who says, I become like all men so that I might save a few. Um, he like would adapt himself to the culture he was in in order to like convince them of the deity of Christ, like the Messiah, and that the Messiah had come to save them. So like Paul would like sort of adapt himself to cultures, but in here he's saying like my fellow countrymen, like I want to provoke them to jealousy. Like I am the Jew of all Jews. Like I want to, but I want to provoke them to jealousy in order that they would accept Christ. Um, and I can only imagine that. I would imagine that part of that has to do with the fact that Paul walked in the spirit and ha- had a, a really huge like manifestation of the Holy Spirit in his life. So, oh, anyway, that was a really long explanation, but I think it's super cool. And I just, I like pray right now in the name of Jesus that the end time harvest will come and that souls will be brought to Jesus and the full fruition of the gospel will go out and I pray right now that, and ask that other people join me in prayer and in calling for the harvest to come forth and calling for the fullness of the Gentiles to come forth so that Israel's hearts will not be hardened anymore, that they'll be softened in order to see the fullness of the gospel, the fullness, the, the true riches of your grace, Lord, and that they will come to have a revelation about Jesus, the Messiah, and that their prick, the prickly skin of the prickly pear will be peeled back to reveal the true softness of their hearts and that they will accept the Messiah, that their, the, the hardness of their hearts will, will be peeled back and reveal the soft, sweet fruit of the fullness of the end times harvest of Israel and your people. And I just pray this in the name of Jesus, and I call it forth in the name of Jesus. And we stand by and bring your word into fruition that we partner with you, God, and pray that the these things will come to pass. And yeah, I just declare this over my city. I declare it over my country. I declare it over Israel. And 
in the name of Jesus, I say, let your word go forth. Let it bring about what you desire for it to come about. In, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, yeah, thanks for joining me on this. I, yeah, thanks for joining me on this, and I, I hope it was a blessing. I hope it's as exciting to you as it is to me. And I feel very honored to have received this dream, and I want to do it justice. Yeah, so in the name of Jesus, God bless you, and I hope you have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.